Oh, thank God he saved us. You know, see, we don't know what destruction is. If we had faced destruction, we would know. Thank God before going to hell, before tasting hell, Jesus tasted hell for us. And it would have been too late for us if we had tried to taste hell. We would have never been able to come out of it. But Jesus went to hell, and when innocent blood cried out, the Holy Spirit went down, lifted up Jesus. And uh, good that it was so good that we didn't go. We didn't have to go to hell. Okay, let me change my map. Praise God, yeah. So uh, we're redeemed from the curse of everlasting death. That's the Christ that we serve. Before I go further, I must, uh, there's a preacher who is coming from India who will be ministering on Tuesday uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning. So some of you just run off just after the offering. So uh, keep in mind. Uh, on Tuesday at 9, 9 to uh, 11, we have our Bible study. So we'll be having a preacher from India, and uh, he'll be ministering. So maybe God willing, sometimes, maybe even on Sunday, but definitely he's ministering on Tuesday. So understanding that we have been redeemed from the curse of death, of sickness, of sin. See, every diabolical, diabolical thing that we have been redeemed from, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice for what we have been redeemed out of. That's every one of um, them. That, that should be the heart of a gratitude. That's the heart of a gratitude that we should have towards the Lord and say, God, I thank God that I didn't have to go to hell. I thank God that I didn't have to go to hell, but I have been made a citizen of heaven. I'm no longer a child of the devil. I no longer have a covenant with the devil. I have a covenant with Almighty God. I have been, rede I have been redeemed from the curse of uh, being in the, uh, having a covenant with the devil. I've been redeemed from it. Let me show you that scripture. Go with me to the book of uh, 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 first, I'm sorry. The book of Isaiah chapter 28, Isaiah 28, and uh, verse number 15, or we'll read from verse number 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, now he's talking to the people of this time, but we're taking out a scripture in particular for us to understand what we have been redeemed from. In verse 15 he says, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and hell. You know, we had a covenant with death and hell. How dangerous is this? We were all, when, when, when the devil, or when the devil tempted Eve, and uh, how she partook, obeying the voice of the devil, committed high treason against God, she eventually brought a covenant that we made with hell and death. But thank God we're redeemed from it. We're redeemed from the covenant because Jesus came. When we, Jesus came, he not only came, he came for the sole purpose of redeeming all mankind. It is by choice that we are saved. It's, it is God's will that we may be saved, but every individual is saved by choice. You've got to choose either death or life. We choose, it's, it, is, it is a choice that we make and say, Jesus, come into my life. 
I receive you, Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I pronounce that you died for me and you rose again on the third day. And I believe with all my heart that there is no other name that is given under heaven whereby men can be saved. So I call upon the name of Jesus. I call upon the name of Jesus. So when I call upon the name of Jesus, I know that I shall be saved. I'm not going to be ashamed. I shall be saved. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans. Let's go to the book of Romans. And uh, in the book of Romans, it says in chapter 10 and verse number 11 and 12, we read Romans chapter 10. And uh, verse 7 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, that's Jesus Christ, shall not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed if you believe in Jesus Christ. On the last day when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you will never be ashamed because you have already accepted Jesus, Lord of your life. You have accepted him to be your Lord. You have accepted him to be the, uh, the, the savior. You believe in your heart that he paid the price on the cross. So through his death, you have been saved. The total cost of redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid his life blood for the redemption of my life. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You will never be ashamed. You will never have to look up and say, I wonder if I'm saved. See, if, you, if you're still wondering if you're saved, get saved. If you still wonder, and if you th still think that you are not a child of God, this is a great opportunity for you to get saved. And you who know that you are saved, rejoice that you are redeemed from hell and death. Rejoice. Some people don't have the assurance that they are saved. If you talk to them, they'll say, how do you know that you are saved? Uh, well, I, uh, I don't know. I, I belong to so-and-so's church. Well, you belong to so-and-so's church. Now, names of preachers have become so important to people for recognition. But they have forgotten the greatest name that is above every other name. Jesus Christ. He has saved me. It's not the pastor who saved you. It's not the famous or the recognized man who saved you. People remember the names of the preacher because they have been fans of the preacher not being a true disciple of Jesus. They have, people have put themselves to a position where they feel comfortable as if if I go to a certain church, I know that my name is written in the book of life. And everyone who goes to that church I, and, and, uh, and God has already written all the names of the people who are members of this one particular church. That's the biggest lie that the enemy has told you. It is a personal revelation that you have concerning Jesus Christ and knowing him personally, knowing him Lord of your life, having that relationship. It's not by religion that we were saved. It is by relationship. So it's not necessary to recognize or know the name of your pastor. The most important thing, do you know the name of Jesus? I mean, there were these sons of Sceva they were recognized people. They were, they were people who were uh, sons of a particular priest who were practicing uh, witchcraft. So when they saw Paul delivering people by using the name of Jesus, Jesus spoke a word and demons fled. Demons trembled at the name of Jesus. So they thought, well, this is an easy method. We don't have to make all that show. We will also do the same thing. We'll use the name of Jesus so that people would recognize us. And uh, so they took the name of Jesus in vain. 
because the name of Jesus is the spirit of the Lord. The Lord is that spirit. The Bible says in the book of 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 17, the Lord is that spirit. If the Lord is not in the spirit, if, 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 the, if the spirit of God is not in the, in the name of Jesus that we pronounce, then there is no power there. If you, you can even teach a parrot to say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, people even use that as a slang. Oh, my Jesus. When something happens, oh, Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't know that he is a savior. So when the seven sons of Sceva, they try to cast out, they say, I we adjure you in the name of Jesus. And the devils turned around and said, who do you think you are? I know who Paul is because Paul is spirit filled and is born again. And he has a right to use that name of Jesus. I know who Jesus is. I was beaten over and over again by Jesus. Who are you? You know, the most important thing is for you to bear the name of Jesus to such an extent that you have the name of Jesus where demons recognize you because of the name of Jesus and the spirit that is in you and the commitment that you're walking in, knowing the truth because it's a truth that makes people free. It's a truth that makes people free. I can still be somebody who goes to church and still be bound with, not, with having no knowledge about the truth. For instance, people in the masses, most of the Christians, you would believe, they would say, any sickness happens, maybe it's God's will. He's trying to teach me a lesson. This sickness, that they take the scripture out of context, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. That's the biggest lie. Read the scriptures rightly. Jesus said, I have no, ex I no, I have no time to explain where this sin came from when the disciples said, how was this man born blind? Were his parents, uh, there's a curse upon the parents. He said, I have no time to discuss that, but I am here to glorify the name of the Father by healing this man, that the works of God might be made manifest. He never talked about saying that this sickness is unto the glory of God. But how people take scriptures and put together and rhyme it well, and they come, they come to the person who is sick and say, oh, this sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God. So you may have to go on for some time. You don't have to believe that lie. That's, that's not true. But the Bible says when you, when you're, if you're sick, pray. And, if, and, and if, you're, if you're sick, pray. Or call for the elders of the church. That's what the Bible says in James chapter. Let's put that scripture up in the book of uh, James chapter 5 and verse 15. James chapter 5 and verse 15 We'll go to the verse before that, 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. Maybe go one more scripture above, 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any among you? That is the highest form of faith that a person could, uh, could operate in. Is any among you afflicted? Affliction is something that you have been afflicted by demons. You have been afflicted or maybe you're going through an ailment in your body. Is any among you afflicted? Let him, the person who is afflicted, pray. What is prayer? Oh God, if it is your will, heal me. That's not prayer. You better know what the will of God is because you have, if you don't know what the will of the Lord is, then there is no purpose in praying because he answers only those who pray according to his will. And this is a confidence we have in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. It says like this, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, 
he heareth us. So asking is prayer, believing is prayer. So if you, you must have the confidence that, that, that it is God's will for me to be healed. Praying a prayer in this manner by saying, Lord, if it is your will. There was only one man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, if it is your will, heal my leprosy. And Jesus immediately healed the man. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2, he came running and he worshipped Jesus. And he said, Lord, if it is your will, if it is your will, heal me. And Jesus immediately stretched forth his hands and healed him. He, it, it was only one instance we find here. And none of the places we see the disciples praying in such a manner, God, if it is your will, heal. Peter never prayed that way because Peter never saw Jesus praying that way. When there was this woman who was, who was sick and she died and they called for Peter and when Peter went into the house that everybody came and said, oh, these are the clothings that they have. she had made for us and she was such a good woman. Oh, what a lovely lady she was. And Peter had to put them all out and say, out, out, out. It's only the prayer of faith. It's not the prayer of works. It's not all you widows got together and pray and say, oh God, these are the clothings that this woman has given us and she's been such a wonderful woman and she has been such a good woman and, and she ought to be healed because of her, her good works. Not necessarily. You don't have to be healed because of your good works. You only get healed by the prayer of faith. And Peter put them all out, out. And he went down, knelt, and beside the woman and said, woman, arise. Just like the way Jesus prayed, he prayed and got results. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, his will is the information that we get by the Bible from the word of God taking the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth, understanding the word of God. And when we have the right information, it turns out into a revelation. We have a revelation now that it is God's will for me to be healed. There is no question at all. There is no doubts that can arise in our mind. It didn't say how old you ought to be to be healed. It simply says it's God's will. Above all that he wills that you be healed and that you be prosperous even as your soul prospers. Why did Jesus die on the cross? What was the manifestation? I mean, if we talk about Jesus, everybody would talk about how he went around healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. That's what the Bible says. He went around healing all that were oppressed of the level. How did people come seeking for him? Because they knew that he was a healer. People got healed. That was his mighty manifestation. Because he came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil is sin, sickness, disease, and poverty. He came to destroy it once and for all. So that we would have this right information that would turn out to be a revelation and we would pray by revelation and we would use faith in revelation and pray and say, God, it is your will that I be healed. So right now I come in agreement with your word. I only understand your word, Lord. I only understand your word. Your words are true. In the book of Hosea chapter 14 and verse number two, it says, when you come before the Lord, come with words. Come with words, come with the language that he speaks. Come with the words, come with words so that, he, that you, you are talking his language. He understands you're at his realm. When, you, when you're in, 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 a, in a realm of trying to achieve something, you don't know the will of God. Maybe God has, God by his mercy can heal you. But a child of God needs to have good information on a consistent basis. 
A child of God ought to get good information on a consistent basis so that he would know for sure, I know, and, 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 and not that God has forgotten. He said, put me in remembrance. In one of the scriptures in Isaiah 43 or 44, where it says, put me in remembrance. So when you come to me, put me in remembrance. Do you mean to say God is a forgetful God? No, he's not a forgetful God. Maybe we should read that scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 44, yeah, 43, 43 and verse 25, 43 and verse 25 and 26. I, even I, am he that blotteth out, right, erase or abolish, completely wipe out thy transgressions or sins or our rebellion. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for, for mine own sake. You know what God does? He gets the glory when your sins are forgiven. He says, I'm doing this for my sake. I, even I, am blotting out your transgressions for my own sake because I want my people to be clean. I don't want the devil to come and accuse me about my people and will not remember their sins. Put these things into your heart. God is not reminding you of the sins that you have committed. God is not the one who is reminding you of the sins that you have committed. It is the devil or it is your flesh. It is the devil or it's your flesh. I will not remember thy sins. You know, God is a God of integrity. If he says something, that's it. God doesn't remember. If you tell him about what you have done 10, 15 years ago, or maybe what you have done last night for which you have asked forgiveness for, he said, when was it? I can't remember. I don't remember. God does not remember. Why would we have to just try to make God understand? God, you surely know what I have done. He said, when he says, I can't remember, I just can't remember. Because you have a clean slate before the Lord every day. His mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. His compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. People, people, people find it difficult when God makes things easy for us. It's religion that wants to do something. Oh, we, must, we must earn our blessings. We got to earn our blessings. They feel too comfortable to be comforted by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. It's, God is not, he not pleased when, when the preacher brings all kinds of, uh, all kinds of words into your life and reminds you and, and kind of convicts you of some things that you have done in the past, remind you of some of the things that have happened in the past, and uh, God is grieved. The Holy Spirit is grieved. He is not the reminder of our sins. He is a comforter of our souls. He is a comforter. The Bible talks about comfort. He is a comforter of our souls. That does not mean we don't take grace so easy and say, oh, God always forgives me, so I'll just continue to sin. You've got to be somebody who is a, such a rebellious character. And I would say you need to get saved because if, if you are truly saved, you will respond to his love. If you are truly saved, you will respond to his love and respond to his love and say, Lord, with a heart of gratitude, I'm so thankful to you, Lord that you so forgive me and you're so loving to me and, and I, don't, I'm not, I don't have to talk about taking advantage of you. I only have to say, thank you, Lord, that you're always merciful to me and you wouldn't want to repeat the same thing over and over again. And if that person is so stubborn and hard-headed, he's going to pay for the consequences. Sin, the way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. Your life is going to be hard. 
the way of the transgressor is hard. Okay, somebody says, God is merciful, he forgives me. I know my, I, I know I got a ticket to heaven and my seat is assured and I'll just live any old way I want to live on this earth. But the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Right? Proverbs 13 and verse 15 says, Good understanding giveth favor. And you want some favor? Have some good understanding from the scriptures. But the way of the transgressors is hard. Somebody says, I want to take advantage of grace. It's going to be hard. The life is going to be too hard for you. So take grace in the right perspective and understand it to the extent where you will say, God, I thank you that you're so loving and you're so merciful. Your mercy is endure forever. I'm so thankful to you, Lord, that your mercy is endure forever. In Isaiah chapter number 43 and verse 25 or verse 26, put me in remembrance. Put me in remembrance of all the promises. God says, talk to me in my language. It's nice if you understand somebody's language. It's always nice. It's easy to communicate. So God says, my language is the Bible, the word of God. I'm teaching you the word of God. You study the word of God, you understand the word of God, you hear the preachings of the truth, and that's my language. So when you communicate to me, put me in remembrance, talk to me. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified, qualified to be healed, that thou may be justified. Put me in remembrance of my words. Let's plead together. Who is, your, who is the one who is pleading with you? Jesus Christ, who is your intercessor. He's still your intercessor. His ministry is not over yet. He's at the right hand side of the Father interceding for each and every one of us. That we may be saved to the uttermost. I, uh, it's in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost completely that come unto him by God, seeing he ever liveth. His ministry is ever living to intercede for the saints. He's ever living. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost. He's in intercession for you Forever, he ever lives to intercede for you, that you may be saved to the uttermost. What does it mean? Enjoy salvation to the fullest. Some people enjoy salvation partly. They say, okay, I believe in Jesus, and I know I'll just go to church once in a while. Whenever I want to, I'll go to church, or I'll, I'll be a regular attendant to church. I don't care what happens to me. I mean, any old way I live, I'll just accept. If it is defeat, I will accept defeat. If I have victories once in a while, it's perfectly all right with me. But I'm willing to accept anything what God gives me. God does not give you defeat. He gives you salvation to the uttermost. And uttermost is to be completed. He wants you to enjoy salvation to the fullest because your salvation is not just to be saved to go to heaven. That was not the only plan of God. Your salvation is to transform you to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. He has forgiven you for his sake that you might live for his glory and he has purchased you with his precious blood. You're redeemed. You're a child of the Most High God. You're not just saved. Oh, when I close my eyes, I'll open my eyes in heaven. That's a good statement. That's all right. But what about the here, now? You're saved to the uttermost. Therefore, he is able. He is able, but are you willing? Therefore, he is able, that's the will of God, also to save you to the uttermost. 
through intercession and through the reading of the word of God and understanding the truth, he's able to save you to the uttermost so that you might enjoy salvation to the fullest because the word salvation does not simply mean eternal life. It means wholeness, it means healing, it means deliverance, it means to be whole and complete. There's a lot there. I want to be having everything. When it says uttermost, I'm talking about everything. I want everything what salvation means to me. Jesus did not just die for me to have a ticket to go to heaven. Good, I rejoice about that. We could talk about a person who was dying, just like the person who died on the cross with Jesus. Well, he was dying along with Jesus and he was going to be with Jesus. That's it. He was not, he doesn't have any more challenges in this world. He has nothing to do in this world. He's going off with Jesus. So that, to that person, salvation means a ticket to heaven. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That was a good promise that he received that he just closed his eyes and Jesus closed his eyes and they were all in paradise. They were both in paradise. That's good. That promise is good for the person who's, who is. But then what about we? Have you forgotten that we have 365 days a year to live? And you've got a long life that you can live which can, which can be satisfied. You can be satisfied living a long life. Some people think, well, I don't want to be such a radical. I want to go to an early grave. But that's not God's will. The covenant says, the covenant talks about you living a long life. The Bible says those who partake in the communion, and they ought to believe to live a long life. That's why the Bible, it says in the Bible, it says, that's why many are weak. Many are sickly. And many sleep. They go to an early grave because they don't understand that covenant, that covenant is for them to live a long life. Put that scripture up in 1 Corinthians. Okay. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30. For this cause many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep. The word many is definitely a majority. Many are weak, not understanding the truth that they can be saved to the uttermost. Many are weak. I wouldn't want to be a weak character. I want to be strong. I want to be victorious. I don't want to fall into sin. I don't want to fall into sin. I don't want to fall into deliberate act of sin. I don't want to slip into sin and live a weak life. Oh, all the time I fall into sin, all the time. You know, many, many of us, we are not awake. That's the reason we, we fall into sin. If you're going to be awake unto Christ, we will not sin. It says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, 14, and verse 34. 1534. Put that scripture up. 1 Corinthians 1534. Awake to righteousness. Get a revelation of righteousness and so that you will not sin. Awake to righteousness. People who are not awake to righteousness, they continue to keep living in sin. God still loves them, they're saved, they come to church, but God does not get any glory when a person lives in sin. God does not get any glory. He says, for, for, for my sakes, I forgive your transgression. I blot out your, I abolish completely your transgression for my sake. But if somebody has been Blessed to the extent where God can be honored by your life and you still want to continue to keep living a very weakly Christian. I just want to just, I, I just want to live any old way I want to. I mean, I, I love the Lord, I come to church, but I, I have some desires that I want to fulfill. 
You know, if you are awake to righteousness, it's because people are sleeping. That's the reason they, they're not awake. Awake to righteousness. Awake to the teachings of righteousness. The right standing that you have with God. That you will not sin. For some have no knowledge of righteousness. When you talk about righteousness, you're talking about a right relationship with God. Having a right standing with God. Many don't, when we were in the church in the beginning of our time, we never heard the word righteousness. We never heard. We always thought we are sinners saved by grace. But that's standing on two platforms. You either are a sinner or you're a saint. Either you're a sinner or a saved person. So how can you say I'm a sinner saved by grace? Well, you, you ought to say it this way. Put it in the, in the right, right uh, uh, way of saying it. Say it. I was a sinner, but now saved by the blood of Jesus Christ or by the grace of God. I was a sinner. I thank God my days of sin is gone. I'm the righteousness of God now. Awake to righteousness so that you will not sin. People are not awake to righteousness, they're just sleeping. Let the preacher preach, I'll just listen to it and then something gets into me, maybe I'll just go home. They don't want to listen to the teachings of righteousness. I'm not just talking about the assembly here, we are, we are also on media, so there are people who are watching, so don't, don't take it personally, okay? Right, so we can, be, we, can be, we can be sleeping and just let the preacher preach and I'll just say amen to it. When God say, when the preacher says, God giveth and God taketh away, and you say, Amen, you don't even have a revelation of what you're talking about. That was Job in his, pre- in his time of pressure. He said, God giveth and God taketh away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. And everybody say, Amen, and you just receive it. So when you lose something in life, you say, oh yeah, that's right, God gave me and God took it away. But the Bible says, in James 1 and verse 17 says, he said, every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. Every good gift comes down from the Father. It didn't go up. The Father never took it back. He never, he never sucked it back up. It comes from above. And we need to say, thank you, Father. Job, in his time of pressure, he said that. But that has nothing to do with us. And that's a famous scripture that people use in the, even in a funeral. If a young person passes away, they say, my, God needed this child more than we need this child. While the parents are crying, the preacher, has, preacher is trying to comfort the parents by saying, oh, God needed this child is an angel. Maybe God make or made a mistake by sending this child into your life. So he took him back. That's the biggest lie. To comfort the parents. There was a, a, a mother who detested God and said, because the preacher had preached a sermon of this nature. And this woman said, I have nothing to do with God. Because, because if this is God, he's a tyrant. He's an evil character. I don't want nothing to do with this monster. What do I have to do with a monster? He took, took my child away. That's my child. I was enjoying my child. He took my child away because a preacher said it. And she went into a depression and for many long years the husband was trying to comfort her and try to go to church. No, 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 I don't want to listen to any more. I don't have nothing to do with God. Until the, the, the father, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the husband convinced her to come for a particular meeting. And then thereafter she was brought forward not very happily, she was not happy at all to get herself prayed or even hear the word of, even hear the word God. But she was brought forward and the preacher started ministering to her and she said, I have nothing to do with God because God took my child away. 
And the preacher said, no, that's the biggest lie that you have heard. And had to convince her and talk to her. But she said, no, I'm going off. And she went and came back the next day again. The husband tried to... And the next day she was convinced by the preaching. And she came forward and got herself delivered. And that preacher had kept this woman bound for 20 years. That's how many Christians are even bound when they've heard certain scriptures that are taken out of context or, or things that are said by the preacher because they had nothing more to say. They didn't want to be real and truthful to the parents and convince them or, or to comfort them. They just said, God made this happen. And uh, she was delivered. She was delivered, completely delivered. And she said, now I understand. It was God who gave me this child and the devil. Because of my negligence, I lost my child. And she was convinced. And she started being a believer, a true believer back again. So come into a position where you understand that God is a good God and he's a good giver. He's not somebody who takes away. What is the, re what is the big idea in God taking away? Anything from you. What does he need? Why does he need it? And moreover, let's, let's put this in the right perspective. Angels are not made in the class of men or sons of God. Angels were never called sons of God. They are only ministering spirits. And if you see the word minister, it means one who labors in the spiritual realm. One who labors in the spiritual realm. They are ministers sent for those who are heirs of salvation. They are ministers for us. They're ministering for us. Right? They are not, they are not in the class of sons of God. They are, they are in the lower class. They are ministers. But we are called sons of God. Children of the most high God. So don't look at a little baby and say, oh, what an angel she is. I mean, you're downgrading that child's class. Man is made in the image of God and in the likeness of man, in the likeness of God, not in the likeness of an angel. God never looked at an angel and said, oh, I'm going to make man in, in the likeness of an angel. He said, no, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Maybe their image is marred because of the sin, but that's the reason Jesus came to put, put us back into the right position. So that we are called children of the most high God. Children of the most high God. So you have been elevated or you, you, are, you are in the class of being, in the, uh, in the class of being in, as sons of God. And the Bible talks about in the book of uh, Rome, uh, uh, in, in the English translation is wrong, in the book of uh, Psalms chapter 8, Psalm chapter 8, Psalms chapter 8 and verse number, uh, we'll read a few verses from there, we'll verse 3 onwards, Psalm chapter 8 and verse 3, when I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than angels. This is misguiding. God did not make man little lower than angels. That word angels is not the word that is rightly to be used there. It is the word Elohim. Elohim is always referred to God. So thou has made man, thou has made him a little lower than Elohim, which is God, who is God, and has crowned him with glory and honor. So don't, don't, so when you, but if you see the, I think in the Sinhalese translation, it's better there. It's, it's talking about uh, God, I suppose. God has made him little lower than God, or how it, however it goes. So it really, it, so you, when you read that scripture, put it in the right perspective and say, thou has made him little lower than Elohim, or made lower than God. Not lower than angels. 
no bow no bowing down to angels or worshiping angels the bible very strictly commands us don't you ever voluntarily in humility of worshiping angels in colossians chapter 2 and verse number i suppose 14 15 around there or 18 or 19 it talks about don't you ever bow down to angels let no man beguile you of 18 let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he had not seen vainly puffed up in their fleshly minds people who are vainly puffed up in their fleshly minds things that they have not really seen you know satan can put some images before you and you can carry that as a doctrine and say i saw this angelic being who came before me and 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 make a doctrine out of it it's people who are vainly pridefully uh in their fleshly minds that they have been so corrupted in their minds that they they feel they got i got a special revelation i had a special vis- visitation of an angel and then change the doctrines and paul says it like this in the book of galatians chapter 1 even though an angel comes and gives any other gospel apart from what i have galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 i believe 4 5 somewhere around there who gave galatians 4 galatians 1 i'm sorry galatians 1 5 is it 5 or 6 so paul says even if an angel comes let him be a curse 8 okay 8 but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you you know some preachers they can preach something today and they can preach something way off 10 years later they can preach something different because people have itching ears people want to hear something new If you keep preaching the same thing for the next 20 30 years you are not a famous preacher you are too much of a radical and you 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 don't have any new revelations and you they they try to put you out and say you don't have anything new to give us so paul says but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you which we have Uh, preached unto you let him be accursed paul from the day he started he wound up by preaching the same gospel of grace and faith he didn't preach anything apart from that he said i have kept the faith he said my time has come i have kept my faith he kept something he kept the word of god so people who have new revelations time to time See God builds revelation upon revelation and the foundation is Jesus Christ and upon this foundation that we build but no other foundation can any other man lay so people keep placing new foundations and they try to build and people are confused because this preacher for the for the for for 10 years ago he preached something and then maybe 2 3 years later i mean sometimes people even don't hold their preaching for sometimes a month because they feel well i got to give because people have itching ears i got to meet the demands of the people see people want something new i like to i like to entertain the people i want the people to understand that i'm i'm really a man of god who gets new revelations that's why people don't like to keep hearing the same thing over and over again How about you go down you go to your shower and say okay today you gave me i mean for the last whole month i have been i have been i have been having i mean be taking a shower with water can i have something different to take my get myself washed today you don't do that 
Or you go to the kitchen and say, we don't need water today. We don't, we, is there anything else that we can, we can use to make food without water? I mean, that's how sometimes people are so foolish. They want something new. You've got to be watchful. And the preacher ought to know how he deals with the people. When the preachers get so close to the people and, and, and knows the, the wantings and the demands of the congregation and okay, I'll give them what they want. That ought not to be a life-giving preacher. He must be a preacher who is a compromiser, who is more for his belly than for teaching the truth. And Paul says, I'm telling you with weeping that there are many preachers who are preachers Preachers preaching against the cross. In Philippians, he says it like this in Philippians 3 and verse number 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us as an example. Example. Okay, verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm so in love with the people to the extent that I want to give them the truth and I'm sitting with you in this position and I'm weeping and even in telling you right now that there are many that they are Enemies of the gospel, enemies of the cross of Christ. They don't preach the cross. They don't preach the cross. They are enemies of the cross. Some kind of a gospel they would preach just to let people know that, you know, they have some kind of a new revelation and they become famous of their famous sayings and putting the words together, rhyming things together, but they're not scriptural. They're not scriptural. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. The only reason they serve the Lord is to see how much they can get from the people. You find lots of preachers today who would preach anything that you want because they can get their bellies filled. But that's not the preacher that you should follow after. You should go after truth. Uh, a, a good minister of God's word would always lead you to the truth, not lead you unto him. Lead you to the truth, always to the truth. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Who mind the earthly things, they don't have any revelation. It's not from God. There are new revelations that they say, either they are borrowed from some other preacher, who really had a revelation, they pull it up from somebody else and preach it, make it, I mean, they don't have it in their heart. A revelation is something that you, that you mingle your heart together and you are sure that this is God. Now, there is nothing wrong in listening to preachers and, and, and strengthening the revelation that you already have, but you got to personally have a revelation. You got to personally have a revelation. So there are many things who, who mind earthly things just like fleshly. We read that scripture where, where they have had a visitation or they had some kind of a thing that, and they think, my, we, we truly have a, a special revelation. But they're only, they only doing it to their own shame. We close with James chapter number five. James chapter number five. Is any sick among you? Is any afflicted among you? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Learn to pray. Learn to pray. Believe that God answers your prayers if you pray in line with God's word. Let him pray. That's the best method. If any man is merry or if he's if he has found something good that will happen to him, let him sing songs, let him sing psalms. Let him rejoice, praise God. Let him sing and make merry. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Worshiping God and thanking God. 
And the next verse, is any, is any, which means we shouldn't be sick if we are really praying. Is any among you, is any sick among you? It didn't say all, all are sick or many are sick. If there is any, that's, that's how we can put it. Is any sick among you? Because God wants us to live by revelation of God's word that we can pray and receive our answer. When we are afflicted, we speak to the devil. Devil, get out, go. Take your filth and get out. Let them pray. Let them be merry and sing songs. Is any sick among you in the midst of people who are walking in health? If there is any, don't condemn yourself. Don't condemn yourself. Let him call for the elders of the church. Elders of the church. Not the gray-haired ones, the ones who have faith. We always think an elder is somebody who is almost giving up on life and, and maybe God may answer that person. No, there's nothing wrong with gray hairs. I also have some. That's not the problem here. But the most important thing is for us to understand an elder is somebody who is bold in faith. Let's see a quality of an elder. Uh, go with me to the book of First, Second Timothy. Second or First Timothy, First Timothy. Right. <clears throat> First Timothy, chapter five and verse seventeen. First Timothy, chapter five and verse seventeen. Let the elders that rule well be accounted. That's one scripture. The let, let the elders that rule well. That word rule means who guide. Not who control. Who guide well. Be counted worthy of double honor. Right? And then also it talks about an elder... In another scripture also, somebody came to me some time ago and said, who is an elder? Because he went through a situation in his life and then some elder tried to control his life. And then I said, if this elder must have the qualifications uh, according to the scriptures. First Timothy, I think it should be First Timothy. First Peter. Yeah, First Peter it's there, but there's something that has to do with boldness. A deacon. A deacon or an elder. Hmm. First Timothy 3 and verse 8. Likewise must deacons or those who wait. Yeah, this person had a problem with a deacon. Those deacons, likewise must a deacon. You find people taking their deacon stand, but if they really know the word deacon, they would, wouldn't want to stand there. A deacon is somebody who is like a minister, a servant, a waiter. You find a lot of churches which have these people who take the deacon stand. If you tell that you're a waiter, oh, I don't want to be a waiter, I'm a deacon. I'm next in command to the pastor. They wouldn't know that. They would think, well, I don't want to be there. That's what the word deacon means. You're somebody who waits. Likewise, must a deacon be grave, honorable, in other words, honest, respectful, and not double tongue. So there are qualifications of a deacon here. And also there is another, another qualification of the elder. Hmm? Verse 13. Verse 13. Anyway, there's a, there are qualifications of an elder. And especially the elder should be going back again to James. We're going to close with James. And James chapter 5 and verse 15. And let the prayer of faith, uh, verse 14, 14. 
is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. The elders of the church refer to those who are like-minded to the ministry or those who have been in the word and those who are, who are honoring uh, God's word and those who honor even the ministry. People who go like elders, they, disrespect, uh, they are so disrespective. They don't even honor the preacher that they are submitted to. That they feel they don't too much. And, and they kind of, you know, create confusion. And let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They got to be anointed in the name of Jesus. Well, you can use some oil, a point of con contact. But the most important thing is the name of Jesus. So an elder should pray in the name of Jesus, right? Praying over them in the name of Jesus. If you pray in the name of Jesus, you're using the authority. If you're praying in the name of Jesus, you can't say, Lord, if it is your will, Lord, heal this person. Now, there can be people whom we prayed for, and elders, elders who are honest, they go around, they preach the gospel, they, they, they pray over some people die. What do you do about such people? You got to say, thank God, they are, they are more healed right now in heaven. I'll go to the next. You don't have to get upset about somebody whom you prayed for and then he's gone to be with the Lord. Well, it was not your prayer that took him to the Lord, but it simply, it was, it was he had given up on life. There could be cases where people are given up on life and they will say, oh, just come and pray for me, maybe if it is God's will. They may have given up on life, but there are some who are willing to say, yes, I agree, pray with me, I'm going to rise up. But some have given up. So some have even given up praying because they have prayed for a couple of people and then nothing, they have not seen much results. That does not mean that you should not pray, Right? If you count yourself as an elder, if you count yourself as somebody who honors the word of God and you're having the qualities of an elder, being respectful, you, you can go around and pray, lay hands on the people. And the next verse, the second most important thing is, and the prayer of faith is not the prayer of unbelief or fear or trying to know what the will of God is. It's a prayer of faith. So you pray the prayer of faith knowing the will of God, that it is God's will for people to be healed. For all whom Jesus prayed for, they are gone. They're not living. Paul prayed for many people, they're gone. They're not living. Everybody, they have to leave because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Every one of them, dust has to go back to the dust. Right? So don't get upset about people whom you have prayed for and you say, oh, I, I really expected this man to rise up and he's going to be with the Lord. That's the best heal, healing he has got. So thank God for it. So the prayer of faith shall save or heal the sick and the Lord shall raise him up back again. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven. So that is the ministry of, of an elder who goes to minister, not with condemnation, but the prayer of faith. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven, so that he can rise up again. So, so calling upon the elders is a good habit. But if you don't want to just religiously do it and say, well, come along, pray for me. I'm just in the last days of my life and maybe if God's willing, he'll do something. No point calling an elder if you think that you're in the last, almost giving up on life. Then no point calling an elder. Maybe something. If God has given you an opportunity to live, make up your mind to live. Just as the psalmist said, when he was in the deathbed in Psalm 118 and verse number 17, he was dying. He said, I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the works of God. That ought to be your determination. Put the scripture up, 
Psalm 118 and verse number 17. I shall not die. You want somebody to agree with you? Be a little more determined. I shall not die. I don't want to go to an early grave. I shall not die but live and declare the works of God. Don't come to the conclusion of your life by saying, oh, maybe it's time for me to go. No, it's not time for you to go. It's time for you to live. Oh, it's time for me to retire. No, you start refiring. Start doing something differently and start seeing some better results because there is no limit for God. God is a limitless God. You might say, I'm of age now. Well, that doesn't matter. You still can be, if, if, you're, if you know that you're a good character and you're of good age, you can be a blessing. You can, you can be a blessing to the next generation. Don't have to give up on life and say, oh yeah, I just have to give up. Stuff. That's being selfish. Rise up. Be a blessing to people with the knowledge and the experience that you have. He says experience is good. In, Put that scripture up in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 4. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 4. And patience brings experience. And experience brings hope. You know, when you're patient, when you're patient, you know, there are, there are so many hasty people but people who have good experience have peop are people who have had patience. And patience brings experience. And experience brings hope. You can be the person who can bring hope to the hopeless. Today there are people who are in a hopeless shape. But somebody who has been through experience Somebody who has had patience to get that experience in their life. That God is faithful. God is a good God. God is a loving God. He's a faithful God. I want, I want to be around people with experience. With those who have said, I was patient and I got experience. And then hope the next verse says, hope maketh not ashamed. And hope maketh not ashamed. People who have hope, they're not ashamed. Because they know that the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, which has been given unto them. So don't give up on life. Don't give up on life. It's time to live. It's time to live. You know, when people talk about, oh, I'm just going to live for the next couple of years, so what do I have to do? Well, start refiring yourself. Paul said, I have, I'm between two. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. But I choose to live because of you, because of the people, because by me being here, you can have the joy of faith. You can, you can be benefited. So I choose not to die, but to live. Paul would have said, "My, oh, it's time for me to go. I've gone through so much in life. I'm just waiting for the crown. I want to go early. I want to get the first bus that I can get. I don't want, I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry to go. He didn't say that. He said, I'm waiting for the people's sake. So start growing because there is a lot to achieve in life. Whether you're a man or a woman. You're a man or a woman because in the spirit there is no male nor female. You can be a blessing. You can be a blessing. Don't be selfish. Oh, I want to go home early. No, I want to stay. I want to be a blessing. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace that you saved us from hell and death. And made a covenant with us. And saying that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we thank you for each and every person in this place. And those viewers who see these words of life, who hear these words of life, that they can be blessed too. 
that they'll know even if they're in their deathbed, God can raise them up and restore them and forgive them. Some of them are in their beds because they have thought, I have committed too much against people and against the Lord. I might as well go, to, go back, go home to be with the Lord. But that's not the right, right spirit. The true spirit of a man is, I believe that I can be healed and I can be restored and I can be, uh, I can be, I can be forgiven and I can do something great. Because I know I have been a man of patience, I have experience, and, and I now have hope that I am not going to be ashamed. Father God, we thank you for your healing, for your love and your favor upon your people. As we partake in the covenant meal, that you would minister unto us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father.